Good morning. The day after Armistice Day and before Remembrance Sunday, we are mindful not only of the terrible cost of the two world wars, but also of conflicts since, including the appalling events reported from Aleppo and Mosul. I have asked that each Friday at noon we all pray for the people of Syria and Iraq, and I ask this synod to pray now with me Lord, we pray for the people of Syria and Iraq, for an end to killing and terror, for an end to hostilities, for a lasting peace, for courage for those delivering humanitarian aid, for all those seeking to bind up wounds and alleviate suffering, for those made homeless by the conflict for those fleeing as refugees, and for those providing welcome and hospitality. We pray for your church in Syria and Iraq, and for faith in the midst of tragedy and suffering. We pray in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you will have gathered, this has been a time of change in the diocesan office, and I am immensely grateful to our interim diocesan secretary, Charles Darley, for the skill and determination with which he has undertaken the challenges of this role, and for the considerable and necessary changes that he has been undertaking. I'm also extremely grateful to the diocesan staff who've been bearing significant organizational and personal upheaval. The process of bringing the organization into line with our vision and strategy and working towards a, a financial sustainability for the diocese is ongoing, but a huge amount has been achieved since Charles arrived five months ago. Change is always challenging, and there is always the lure of how things used to be, the appeal of the cucumber fields of Egypt. But if I can mix my biblical metaphors, our hand is now firmly on the plough, and we are definitely looking forward, and we are not turning back. So I am thrilled that we have appointed Anna Hughes to continue this movement as our new diocesan secretary. Anna is currently chief executive officer of Suffolk Mind, the mental health charity, having previously been their finance director, and earlier was finance director of Ipswich Town Football Club, <clears throat> which you can imagine was a challenge. <laughs> She's qualified as a chartered accountant and read geography at Durham, which in my experience trains you to do anything. <laughs> she impressed the panel with her positive and open attitude, her evident experience in leading organizational change and development, both constructively and inclusively, while facing considerable resource constraints. Of course, she is no stranger to the challenges of church buildings, have, having just led the successful rejuvenation and refurbishment of St. Mary's of the Quay as the new Suffolk Mind Wellbeing Centre, just down the road here, just uh, known now as Key Place. Anna is a lifelong Anglican and brings with her an understanding of the challenges and opportunities for rural as well as urban churches. She'll start with us on January the 30th, and I'm delighted that she is here this morning, and I'm going to ask her to just come up and say a very few words to us.
Good morning, and thank you for that introduction. I think you already said too much. <laughs> As you, does, can everybody hear me? Oh, well, what do I need to do to, this, to make this work? We're norm normally more organised than this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you. It usually works. Try that. Okay. Does this work? Good morning and thank you for the introduction. I am really excited by the invitation from Bishop Martin to join you as Diocesan Secretary next year. As you already know, that's going to be the 30th of January. I have great respect for the work of the Church of England and I know in Suffolk that a lot has been going on to meet the challenges that you have been facing. And I am really looking forward to playing my part in working together and helping us to engage with and deliver the strategy and vision of growing in God. As Bishop Martin has already said, I do live in Suffolk, I lived in Suffolk for about 15 years and, and I love Suffolk actually. I've worked here most of that time, starting with the football club. And as he said, uh, that it had just come out of administration, so it was in quite severe financial difficulties. And so I learned a lot about financial constraint I didn't learn very much about football, and I have yet to master the uh, offside rule, and I don't intend to. Um, but what I also really learned there was the, the power of working with a group of very passionate and very able people united behind one common goal. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. That's my, my only joke. Um, more recently, I, as Bishop Martin said, I've been with Suffolk Mind, and again, that's been a great learning curve for me. Again, we continue to face great financial constraints. I think that's the world of today. But what we have also been doing is working on a strategy, a very bold strategy, as to how to increase our influence, both in terms of uh, how we influence future mental health services, but how we increase the conversation that we can all have around mental health. So it is very bold because it's not an easy subject, but it's one that we are striving very hard to work on and one that will continue after I've gone, I hope. So I hope and I believe that my experiences can help us all work together in our work to grow the work of the church in Suffolk. And once again, I really look forward to joining you in January. Thank you. I would just, at this point, ask Synod to continue to keep Nicholas in our prayers. His kidney transplant operation is on November the 29th, or scheduled for November the 29th. So please pray for him, for Nicola, and for all the family. In a few minutes' time, we will be looking at our priorities and our action points from the strategic plan and their implementation. And I just need to underline, we have made an extraordinary amount of progress since the last synod, and are now getting down to the very concrete actions that we need to take that flow from our strategy. I want to take a few minutes, therefore, just reflecting on the context in which this activity is placed. And the context, of course, is God's call on us and God's activity among us. When we started the vision and strategy process, the foundational statements that were made over and over again by those involved in the process were about God's presence and activity in our communities, in people's lives and into which God is calling us to participate. Everyone we spoke to started with that position, that God is at work calling us to join with God in that work. God's action comes first. That's why the phrase, God is with us, begins our vision statement. All that we and all, all that we are and all that we do is in response to God's presence and call among us. The presence and call incarnated for us in the person, the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our first response to God's presence among us 
and the goodness God pours upon us is gratitude. Gratefulness is the heart of prayer and the continuing response of faith. God is giving us all we need to follow God's call. Gratitude is our response. And when our disposition is gratitude, then we are open to God's call, to God's activity among us, open to possibility, open to what is new, open to what is life-giving. We are living in profoundly uncertain times on a global scale that has impact on all our lives. The events of recent months and days in Europe, the Middle East, and the United States are raising extraordinary challenges about human worth and dignity, and of what it takes to make human community. As Christians, we are called to respond again out of gratitude. Gratitude to the God who made us all and calls us all into communities where difference is gift, not threat, where the other, whoever we and they are, is a child of God, for of such is the kingdom of God. So our response to God's call is always action, generous, grateful, faithful action, not for our own sake, but for the sake of those that we are called to serve, carrying, caring and valuing as God does. And we give of ourselves in generosity and love when we are grateful for what we have received ourselves, knowing ourselves loved and cherished. I see this in a range of places. I see this in congregations that have been enlivened and deepened, where worship, fellowship and service are wonderfully intertwined. I see it in ventures where people are taking risks, engaging with folk that they have not engaged with before, having conversations about faith, not afraid of not having the answers, building new communities of friendship and faith. I see it in community projects, small and large, caring for people across our county in a range of needs, making a difference in different people's lives and seeking neither recognition nor reward. These aren't good news stories. They are great news stories for us all to rejoice in, for us all to be grateful for. They include stories of failure as well as success, stories of having a go and it not working, and stories of having a go and being completely surprised by the response. Stories of people hearing God's call and stepping into the unknown. We will hear of two later this morning. And let me just hold up a third example that I encountered just a couple of weeks ago, a couple of Mondays ago, which is the remarkable Causeway community at All Saints Sudbury. This is a community of people with learning disabilities who gather monthly for an evening of worship and fellowship with the wonderful leadership of Lynn Fish and her team. There are, of course, numerous examples across the diocese, often in involving quite small steps, but which are making a real difference. The next meeting of this synod will be in the cathedral in Bury St Edmunds on March the 11th. I see you're reaching for your diaries. <laughs> I'm also going to suggest, without having consulted with anybody um, except Mike, 
that we might want to start half an hour later. Does that meet with some agreement? It, it's just, I mean, given the, the distance that people will be traveling from the northeast of the diocese, I think we just need to give people a bit more time. We could even think of starting, finishing half an hour earlier. That may be going too far. That I can see rebellion over here on my left. <coughs> um, on Ash Wednesday, which is 10 days before March the 11th, uh, Ash Wednesday is March the 1st, Bishop Mike and I will impose ashes and celebrate the Eucharist on, or near if the weather is too bad, Dunwich Beach, at the start of our pilgrimage from Dunwich to Bury. We are going to spend 10 days walking, vis visiting villages, schools, community programs, congregations, individuals, farms, businesses, to celebrate how the people of this diocese are responding to God's presence and call among us. We invite whoever wishes to and is able to, to join us along sections of our journey. We will be inviting people to pray with us as we go, giving thanks for all that God is doing in our lives and the lives of our communities. And on Saturday, March the 11th at 9.30, I will burst through the east door <laughs> of the cathedral with Bishop Mike catching up not far behind. <laughs> And we will share with you what we have seen, the great news stories of growth, of sacrifice, of love, of service, of celebration, of struggle, of faithfulness, of compassion, of witness, of justice, and of rejoicing. And with gratefulness, we will share the stories of what people, grateful people, are doing in response to God's presence and call among us. And Mike and I cannot wait to do that. Thank you.